<laughs> so, thank you very much for coming. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize because actually, well, Japanese philosophy in general isn't the theme of my research in my PhD. I study German idealism, uh, more, more precisely the concept of determination in German idealism, but I think there are some connections, some interesting connections with Japanese philosophy that could be made regarding the topic of dialectics. And uh, I wanted to explore a little bit those uh, connections in this conference, but now that there are so many people here, I'm a little bit nervous about it, so you excuse me if I say a lot of things that don't make much sense. Uh, and it probably doesn't help that I want to start with a quote from, Z from Zizek, but in, but in his book, uh, Less Than Nothing, his book about Hegel, he actually has a quote where he says that in comparison to Buddhist ontology, what he calls Buddhist ontology, not even Hegel's dialectic seems radical enough. Uh, I'm quoting right, right now. Uh, for him, being still has primacy over nothing. Negativity is still limited to the self-mediating movement of the absolute spirit, which thus maintains a minimum of substantial identity. However, uh, Zizek himself also rel relativizes this critic of Hegelian dialectics by saying that, uh, by criticizing Buddhist ontology and saying that it, uh, it lacks the properly Hegelian dialectical process in which negativity is not reduced to a self-mediation of the positive absolute, but on the contrary, positive reality arises as a result of the self-relational negativity. And so, after reading that, I thought that, that one could actually maybe raise a, an interesting discussion about what could be possibly seen as two different types of dialectics, a kind of Hegelian dialectic and one other kind of dialectic that I see mostly exemplified by the, by the philosophy of Nagarjuna and his discourse on emptiness. And then I wanted to ask to what extent in that case one should think of ways of bringing those two types of dialectics together, as if each one of them is capable of thinking of something you know, uh, that the other can't, and moreover thinking dialectically of something or some, some kind of relationship, while the other is not capable of doing that. Uh, but in order to actually discuss this more truly, uh, first I should say what I understand by dialectics. And again, this is a very rough draft and a lot of ideas are going to come really summarized. They, they can be a lot problematized later, but I'm just going to begin with that. Uh, so I think that what I'm defining here as dialectics is could be understood as a way of uh, overcoming oppos overcoming opposition or my or more precisely overcoming the separation of opposites by means of a common origin that's that is to say that opposites are not really are ultimately separated from each other because they share a common origin and in that sense they are uh, one cannot think of opposites as just absolutely separated from each other so you have to think then in that constitutive relationship but then the question uh, arises of how can you do that? In what way can you think opposites has not separated from each other? And I would say that there are mainly, or at first, two different ways of conceiving that possibility, and each way uh, results in a different kind of dialectic. Dialectics. Uh, the first one, I would say, and then, of course, to make things worse, I'm going to make a very lousy drawing. Uh, the first one, I, I would say, you have a relationship between opposites, but that relationship ultimately is a form of self-relationship from one of the opposites. So the relationship is only possible because it's actually one, one of the terms relating to itself and producing its opposite. And that's why one can, share, one can say that they share a common origin, and you, have this dialectic, you can have this dialectic explanation of the opposites. And I would call that kind of dialectics a self-relation dialectics. But the other way is to say that from the very beginning, only the relationship makes it possible that the, the, there's a, the, the common origin is the relationship itself, 
and it cannot be reduced or brought back to a kind of self-relationship from one of the terms. You just have the relationship, and so the terms are actually external to each other, and so you, have, you really have a kind of external relationship to the t of the terms to each other, because what makes this relationship possible is the, rela is the relationship itself, not, which cannot be reduced to something that has its origin at the self-relationship of one of the terms. So that would be an other relationship, dialectics. And it seems to me that each type, each kind of those dial dialectics, they, they, well, between thinking about self-relationship and other relationship, they always consider that there is only, uh, one can only think dialectically according to their own conception of relation. That is, you, one can only think dialectically if you think, if you think the relationship in terms of self-relationship, or one can only think dialectically if you think the relationship in terms of other relationship. So there's always one of, between self-relation and other relation, always one of the kinds of relationship is taken has been the non-dialectical one. In Hegel's case, for instance, it's very clear when, when we are talking about external relationships or other relationships in that case, that's always the way of the understanding of conceiving the relationship between the opposites and not the way of reason, which actually is capable of unifying both. And then uh, the idea that seems to me that I wanted to discuss is the, uh, rather about the question whether it would be possible to bring those dialectics together. In a, it would be sort of a dialectics of dialectics in the sense of saying, well, each dialectic is really conceives of an opposition between what's dialectical and what is not, which isn't really overcome. And then uh, it raised the question if you could bring those two kinds of dialectics together in order to think of a, di a dialectic in which both other relation and self-relation are conceived as being in themselves dialectical and not only in so far as they are grounded in one another. And what I want to propose here is that uh, at least the way I see it, it seems to me that it's precisely a sort of a dialectics of this sort that one can see as Nishida and uh, Tanabe are trying to bring about, uh, especially Nishida is also clear when he talks about an absolute dialectics, I think it's something in that direction. That is, how do you bring those two, kind, two kinds of dialectics together in order to be able to think reality in its totality as dialectical, so to speak. But in order to show that or try to show that, I'll first give one example of each one of those kinds of dialectics, as I see it, that is of self-relation dialectics and other relation dialectics. The e example of self-relation dialectics, of course, is going to be Hegel. And the example of uh, other relation dialectics is going to be Nagarjuna. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to begin with Hegel, most specifically in the science of logic. Uh, well, in the science of logic, uh, there's this methodological question about how can one begin science with no presuppositions. And uh, since the science of logic is supposed to be the very mother of our science, or, the, or in a way, the science uh, by excellence, it's precisely the science which has to be, which has to have absolutely no presupposition and thus it has to be absolutely no, it has to have, it can't begin with anything determinate. That is, with anything that has mediation, with anything that has a relationship to something other by means of which it's mediated. So that means you have to begin with something indeterminate, uh, something which excludes all determination, all mediation, something which purely and only uh, by itself and which uh, presupposes nothing external to it. Uh, and that is why Hegel, uh, in the science of logic, begins with being. Being has this absolutely indeterminate that excludes all determination, exude, excludes all sorts of mediation. But the issue here is, and that's how we come more specifically to the self-relationship in Hegel, because it's actually about the different kinds of negation and how you come to self-negation as, self, as the self-relationship. This beginning, the, the problem with this beginning is that it's supposed to be the exclusion of all determination. So it's supposed to have one 
a relation of oppo opposition to everything that is determinate. But in that sense, something remains external to it, namely determination itself. And so it remains something that has something external to it and must presuppose something external to it. And thus it must overcome this, uh, this moment because, as Hegel would put it, uh, uh, the, the indeterminacy of being is the being is being is the determin is the determinateness of being. It's already the way it's determined because it excludes something from itself. And if it's going to be something that has everything internal to itself, then it has to deny to overcome this position of itself has something that excludes determination. And that means precisely that it has to realize itself by means of determination. Or, which implies that determination can't be something external to it, but rather internal to it. And that its negation of determination can't be a negation that excludes, a negation that makes it external. But rather it has to be something that results from the thing itself that is negated. And thus that contains that which is negated, which is the very idea of determinate negation, of, of Hebron. And by doing this progressive negation of determinations in, in, uh, by means of determinate negation, one is supposed to eventually arrive precisely at the absolute negation, where all determinations are negated, but not in a way that exclude them, or that annihilate them, or that put them as something external, but rather has something that is fully internalized. And in that way, you come really to the realization of self-determination, of self-relation, so to speak, has the means by means of which uh, opposites are related, and thus you have this uh, self-relation dialectics. And of course, I decided to talk for too about too much stuff for 20 minutes, but we're going to make it. Uh, so that's the example of self-relation. When it comes to Nagarjuna, has the has an, an example of other relation dialectics. I think the most important idea that we have to have here is, of course, of emptiness. Like when Nagarjuna is writing his uh, fundamental wisdom of the middle of the middle way, the Mulamadya Makakarika, uh, and he's attempting to show that all things are empty. But em emptiness, that's very important to remind, is, is a transitive. Property. It's, it's to be empty of something. It's to be empty of essence, of or of own being, or of own nature, what have you. It's the swabhava in Sanskrit. But this idea that something has a, an, in, an independent existence, completely unrelated to other things, and that subsists has something eternal and permanent in that way, without requiring requiring or having any sort of relationship to something external to it. And thus, in in the fundamental wisdom of the middle way, Nagarjuna is precisely attempting, attempting to show that every time that you think has some, of something has an essence, you come to a contradiction, you come to an absurd, because ultimately everything that you try to think of, you're going to have to think it about, uh, about it in a sort of relationship. And thus you can't, you ha you can't think of it as an essence, an essence in a very strict sense. And so you have to think of it only in its condition as empty, as a, as a relation as in relation to something. But then one could raise the objection that uh, Nagarjuna would be saying, well, OK, so the essence of things is to be empty, right? Everything is empty, so that must be the essence of everything. And from that, it results that nothing ultimately exists. And Naga Nagarjuna handles this opposition in the chapter, this uh, uh, this objection in, his, in the chapter 24 of the Fundamental Wisdom of the Middle Way when he distinguishes the two truths of Buddhism. And he talks about, and of course, the interpretation of what is the, dis, what is the dis, distinction between the two truths and so on and so forth is very polemic. I'm going to defend one version of how I see it, and I won't be able to defend it very, very truly, but bear with me. Uh, but the way I see this distinction between the two truths, the, conven the conventional truth as it is, and the ultimate, tr the ultimate truth, is that Nagarjuna says that the conventional truth is that everything exists in a conventional way, that is, in a relationship to other things. While the ultimate truth denies that everything exists in the ultimate way, that is, has accents, has something that ultimately doesn't rely on, uh, on, on relationships. But then, both of those truths 
are in themselves empty. That, that is, they are not. They are not describing essences because emptiness itself wouldn't ex exist apart from that of which it it is the emptiness of. It only exists in thing. It only exists as a property of those things which are empty. So in that way, one could say even relation understood as emptiness is itself only possible in relation, and in, in a relation something external to it. Uh, that's the theory of the, or the idea of the emptiness of emptiness, and Nagarjuna himself says that emptiness is also a conventional designation in that chapter, so that's, that's the way I would read it. But then, now that we came to the, the exposition of those two different kinds of dialectics, I would like to show, well, clearly, in Hegel, a self -re other relation, that is, relationship to something other, is always grounded in a form of self-relationship, because the opposite is always produced by an internal, an internal movement of the thing itself. It produces its opposite and then negates its opposite as a way of relating it to itself. So every kind of other relationship is ultimately grounded in self-relationship. In Agajana, on the other way, it's the other way around, because there's no ultimate self, there's no Atman, there's no self which, sust which sustains apart from conventional from uh, existence, from relational existence. But in relational existence, one could say that there exists some kind of self, but that self is only a conventional one. So the existence of the self-relationship self is ultimately grounded in another relationship. Uh, well, and now to... Uh, what I would like to try very shortly to show is that it seems to me that uh, Nishida and Tanabe are, in a way, trying really to bo bring do both of those kinds of uh, dialectics together by thinking uh, self, uh, both, that both self-relationship and other relationship are necessary moments of, uh, of this dialectical thinking, which can't really be reduced to each other. And I think that comes, of course, I don't have much time now to say about that, to talk about that, but in Ishida's case, I think it comes very, it, sometimes it comes very clearly by the idea of the relationship between the one and the many, and the idea, always the idea of the simultaneity, that the one is, uh, is simultaneously, simultaneously the many, and the many is simultaneously the one, and that, that's, uh, that's a thought that comes already in the inquiry into the good, when he's talking about the fundamental mode of reality. But it's something that later on he, he is going to try to conceive in another way by means of the logic of the place. In the, and there's this text of the self-identity and continuity of the world, where he talks precisely about thinking of an absolute uh, dialectic in one which can think, one can think about the simultaneous relationship of the one and the many, or of the singular and universal, in which they determine each other reciprocally. And it's not that one is grounded, on, only one is grounded on the other, but actually both are grounded one on the other. But, and that, and that is something that would happen through, through means of the self-determination of the place. But then, it seems that that's precisely the, the reason why Tanabe is going to criticize uh, Nishida in his text on attempt, attempt on a clarification of the logic of species, where he criticizes this very idea that once you think that, uh, that there's something that is intuited, something that from which you have an intuition, an immediate intuition, and that is that place or that, uh, that self determines itself and in that way rise, gives place to the one and the many, you're already ultimately thinking about a being because you're again thinking in terms of self-relation. And in order to really think about dialectics, one has to think, according to Tanabe, about absolute mediation. And a mediation that mediates itself, that is, it, oh, this, if absolute nothingness has to be apprehended as absolute mediation, that means that, that, nothing, that nothingness itself can only exist in its relationship to being. And so, and that would be the properly dialectical way of conceiving both the relationship of being and nothing uh, has a reciprocal relationship, one could say, by thinking, thinking in terms of absolute mediation. The issue here, as I see it, because, and I'll say it very brief, briefly because I'm already almost out, out of time, 
But it seems to me that Nishida and Tanabe, both of them propose, again, just different versions of self-relation and other relation dialectics, either by the self-determination of the place or the absolute mediation of, or the, or the terms of absolute mediation. And so to conclude in one minute, I would say that maybe a way to, tr is, that, is that because there is no other way, even uh, always when we think about dialectics, is it the case that we have to choose between one or, and another? I would like to say I don't think so, but I think that in order to think about other possibility, we have really to still question ourselves of, uh, about this, the meaning of the concept of absolute nothingness. And I would think that a key point a key formulation to find another way of thinking about it is one formulation that Nishida uses to describe absolute nothing, nothingness, that is determination without determinant, or uh, in German because I, I can't read Japanese, but uh, Bestimmung ohne Bestimmendes. And I think that would lead us in a good way in order to try to think really a way of bringing those dialectics together. But that's what I had to say. Thank you very much. Well, whatever you think. Have... Well, maybe it's better if they, because they're already. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, please. Yeah. So, thank you very much for your talk. It was, uh, it was very clear and very uh, uh, rich in content. Um, <laughs> um, I, I, I see the project of what you propose, like these two types of dialectics, and try to bring them uh, together. It is something which I have also kind of tried uh, to deal with in my research. Um, and I think. In a sense, it is too ambitious, personally, uh, and I want to friendly challenge uh, this uh, very attempt uh, because I think you are being secretly Hegelian here. Uh, what you <laughs> well, not it's not that secret. Not secret. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, if you either have on the one side this uh, self-relating dialectics, like uh, the opposite being said mm -hmm. by uh, one of the of the opposites, and the second dialectics uh, types of the uh, type of dialectics where like these two are are completely separated. Uh, the way I see it is either you choose one or the other. If you want to see the whole of reality dialectically and bring them both together, this is actually in itself already Hegel. Hegel talks a lot of Nietzsche, etc. Um, my my um, way to see this would be, uh, and, and you kind of already said that uh, with your last comment on uh, on the uh, is maybe if we focus on where the Bestimmung comes from, like the determination, uh, we can find a solution to this opposition. Like, is it either the Bestimmendes, the subject? Come, does it come from the subject? Is this uh, an opposition which uh, is the result of knowledge? Is it like uh, an epistemological problem? Or does it come from the object? Is it uh, an ontological problem? Is the object in itself contradictory, so to speak? So does the object have these two opposites? So I think where you put the focus here will give you one solution of the or the other. But uh, having both at the same time, I'm very scared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad you said that, because I would say that it's no secret that I'm a Hegelian in a way, but it might be that I'm actually more of a skeptic than anything else, because ultimately, I think that, well, of course, I use this formulation for kind of poorly to say the whole of reality, but rather I meant that to think about both relationships in dialectical terms. But I think that if you're going to do that, you're ultimately really having to take a sort of skeptical instance because, and that's because I wouldn't go the way you, you went, because that idea of from where does determination comes from, I think that is the problem, that we still think in terms of having an origin of determination. And that's what wouldn't be the case if you talk of a determination without determinant. But then you have to think about something, a different kind of logic even, I would say, and a, a different way of conceiving of the principle of sufficient reason, even. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, I'm also kind of thinking that you're um, on the Hegelian track, because I think that Nagarjuna, <laughs> you try to synthesize both. You try to find something in which you can uh, synthesize both, so it's kind of a... Uh, the Hegelian way. And Nagajuna, I don't think he tries to primarily try to synthesize, but he says it's neither this nor that. He always negates. He just goes on negating and negating. And yeah. 
Uh, it's also interesting for Japanese philosophy because I think Zen, Zen Buddhism, um, kind of thinking of Zen Buddhism is based on this kind of thinking, and, and then you have the expression uh, fun, 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 like not two, not one. So you, they wouldn't try to get the one. They would say, no, it's yeah. also not this. You, you, um, everything you try to, mm -hmm. every determination or every synthesis you try, you will fail. Yeah. It's not this, it's not that, it's not both, it's not uh, either or or neither nor. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then, uh, for example, Zen Buddhism, this leads to kind of the self, um, I think, self overcoming of logic itself. Because they go back and, and say, okay, now logic has kind of negated everything in itself. And now we are here again in the phenomenal world. We are, we are again in a concrete everyday experience. Yeah. And this everyday experience is the, this thing we are trying to talk about in logic. And then you, you get more kind of a performative way to, to cope with this logical problem. So yeah. what, what do you think about this kind of logic negating itself and coming back to maybe non-logic? Yeah, but that's that's the thing. Uh, or paradoxical kind of mm -hmm. accepting the paradox. What, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, but that's actually that's precisely the point. Uh, I, I, of course, that's, with the time I had here, I, I couldn't even exactly express what I meant by thinking this dialectics of dialectics, so to speak. But it wouldn't be in in that sense. I, I don't think it would be something in a synthesis in that sense. I would think really, and I'm also. It was very interesting that we had the Heisig's talk about this notion of absolute in the absolute nothingness and how it was problematic. And I totally agree, but I think that the, in order to think about that in a more consistent or conse uh, consequent way, we shouldn't be maybe talking about radical connectiveness, because I think that would be just other relation dialectics, so to speak. I, w I think the most interesting idea maybe is the idea of simultaneity. And that's what I mean by when I mean uh, when I am talking about thinking both self and other relationship together, not as a synthesis, as in if one would mm -hmm. take over the other, but rather literally in terms of a simultaneity in which both are necessary, but they don't, they are not reducible to each other. Yep. Or. or. Uh, yes. Starting from the last, the very last thing you said, it might be that in the soku relationship, where you actually have in a soku way. Both, mm -hmm. in in the sense that the soccer relationship does have a sort of, of direct connectedness, so it's not randomly a, you choose a triangle and a square, and that's it, it makes sense in just in the Hegelian sense, but that's a little problematic because, for instance, you can take a soku a soku relationship mm -hmm. is not random geometrical shapes; it's a magatama, so more or less like the the symbol we're very familiar with yin and yang, so yeah. they're compenetrating, and that's where mm -hmm. the simultaneity is. So in a way, they have an internal dialectic because they are matching. Sh there's yeah. a match in their shapes of opposition, and at the same time, no one, no one, no one is has a priority on the yeah. other. There's no hierarchy. There's no one-way dialectic, which is which is my my problem with Hegel. Is like theological doesn't go yeah. back and forth. Mm -hmm. It's a one-way dialectic. So it might be that Soku, and how then of course it will have to be developed in different authors, in yeah. it's both pre-modern and then renewed in modern Japanese philosophy, but it would seem that Soku, by being Soku in itself, does have in a, a certain way something of both. Yeah. This said, I am, as, as many other people that just, uh, just told you, uh, way more, way more convinced by the, the external dialectics, as you said, mm -hmm. and more in the, the yeah. Arjuna side. It's more uh, it has a stronger stress on actual daily daily reality than yeah. the this Hegelian pull towards totality. Yeah. Well, well, thank you for that. And I would say, of course, I mean. I'm kind of playing the erratic role here, right? We are kind of defending Hegel in a place where people, where everyone's <laughs> talking about nothingness. What the hell am I doing? But uh, but it's it's also because I'm really, really seducted even by Nagarjuna and by Nishida and what have you, and this dialect because ultimately also it's closer to a skeptical stance to which I'm I'm really more attuned to also. But on the other hand, after dealing with that for a while, you kind of start wondering if there isn't a limit to that as well. And it's not about totality, but rather about thinking about self-relation. And that's rather what's the problem for me. I don't think, I don't think that it suffices 
to f or other dialectics in that way suffices to understand self-relationship or to explain self-relationship. You, you can't reduce self-relationship just to a sort of other relationship in order to make it clear, in, mod in order to explain also many dimensions, I would say, of our society, of how it developed and so on and so forth. I think that's also why I think uh, there was this talk about radical connect, uh, connect, uh, connectivity and so forth uh, in Isaac's talk. But I would say that you also have to think about disconnectivity. And if you don't think about that, you really can't explain a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry. Yeah, this, I mean, this is first time for him, so. Well, thank you. Well, somehow I feel sympathetic to part of what you say, but also sympathetic to the criticism. Yeah. Because, no, first thing, I would follow what uh, Lorenzo has said, and I would like to add that in a way I feel that in Nishita, you also see the seed of this attempt to harmonize both sides. Mm -hmm. And I think that a good, I mean, a good advocate for this idea would be how to see how you see this developed in Nishitani's philosophy. Mm. I think that you can see more clearly. Yeah. But in the end, I think Nish Nishita probably tried to do, mm -hmm. but didn't survive in, yeah. to a point. Tanabe's criticism. But I think finally, what Nishitani, the way Nishitani formulates it is how we can explain reality in a way that we can explain the interconnectedness of things, some of the unity mm -hmm. of reality, without excluding plurality. Mm -hmm. Also, this, well, now I'd like to add, add a second comment in that direction. I don't know if it would be reasonable to put this in terms of trying to do a dialectic of dialectics, because second order logic usually leads to antinomies. And a good prob I don't know if that's case, but that would probably happen if you tried to develop that again in that direction. So it would be better to find another expression, probably. Yeah, maybe. The thing is, uh, the thing is, I think dialectics is, that's the thing. I know that it's very contaminated with this Hegelian uh, baggage, so to speak. And I know I'm suspicious to talk about that. I'm not afraid of Hegel. I'm more afraid of Hegel. Well, I'm afraid of Hegel. That could be a fair The second? The second order logic. Ah, second order logic, sure, sure. But oh, okay. I see that. That might. That's mm. that's a good. That's a that's a very good point. But uh, again, I think it comes. It also comes to what we think about as dialectics. And I, I, if you ultimately think that dialectics is something that isn't necessarily in itself as a kind of self relationship in, in which it would, it would be just a second order, uh, but rather precisely a way, even a skeptical way of dealing with opposition but, and showing that at the same time you can't separate both, you have to think them together, but that is also not enough and you're always kind of moving back and forth. Maybe it's not, it's not so bad to talk about dialectics as, of, uh, of dialectics as long as we don't understand that as a synthesis of dialectics or something like that. But rather as relating even, I would say. Okay, yeah. I think it was a rich discussion of dialectics and uh, yeah. it can go even longer, but yeah. uh, uh, unfortunately the time is running out. So yeah, yeah please give Lucas the big applause.